Well, great to see all of you. Um, let me add my belated uh, welcome to Stanford. Um, I think you're going to find that you're going to have a fabulous time here. Uh, this is a place that encourages interaction, collaboration, entrepreneurship. Uh, it's just the perfect place for you all to be. So welcome to Stanford. Um, as Sally said, my purpose today is to give you a little bit of window into the School of Earth, Energy, and Environmental Sciences. And as the name indicates, Energy R Us. Um, this is uh, one of the main themes that has uh, been dominant in this school for actually since its inception in 1949. And so I'm eager to give you some window into what we do. So first, a little bit of background about the school. Um, we are, in fact, the key player here in the university and we, um, in, in the energy arena, and we uh, partner up with uh, all the other units here in the university that are deeply involved in, in energy, pre-court, obviously, uh, Slack as well, uh, the Woods Institute for the Environment, and that may not be immediately obvious to some of you why that would be the case, but we'll get to that in a moment, and certainly the School of Engineering as well as others. Um, we focus principally, but not exclusively, on what you would call the upstream aspects of energy, that is, things associated with the resources themselves, as well as the engineering of those resources, as I'll show you here in a bit. So our school is structured in the following way. We have four departments, Earth System Science, Energy Resources Engineering. So uh, that is a, an engineering department that is not in the School of Engineering. It's actually in the School uh, of uh, Earth Energy and Environmental Resources, Geological Sciences, and Geophysics. Uh, we have several interdisciplinary programs. One is an undergraduate program. It was a essentially um, the first of its kind in this country and has been widely emulated since called the Earth Systems Program. And we have two graduate interdisciplinary programs, and I think maybe some of you are associated with one of these here. Uh, one is the Emmet Interdisciplinary Program in Environment and Resources, um, and energy enters into that both in the environmental side and the resource side. This is a program that has a PhD track but it also has an interesting joint degree aspect between the law school and the business school and potentially other schools. So for instance, it's possible to get an MBA in environmental or energy sciences and uh, or energy and get a master's at the same time in our school uh, focusing on the science or engineering aspects of the resource. And then we have a brand new master's program called the Sustainability Science and Practice Program that again, uh, if you think about energy and the needs of energy as being issues that involve sustainability, it has a natural home in this particular program as well. And the bottom line is that every single one of these units is somehow or another involved in energy research and teaching. Um, so we cover the waterfront in terms of upstream aspects of energy. Um, and so that includes things like the identification, the assessment and modeling of natural resources of a variety of kinds. Um, oil and gas, obviously, and we've been doing this for a long time. Steam and hot water, geothermal, in other words. Uh, we're also concerned about the elements that drive modern technology, rare earth elements, lithium, battery storage, and gas hydrates, uh, currently untapped but potential vast source of natural gas that you may not have heard about before. Um, so we're concerned with the fundamental characterization of earth energy materials. So for instance, in the case of natural gas reservoirs, uh, the very physical properties of those reservoirs and how they get modified over the course of gas production. Uh, we're also concerned about the optimization, the engineering practice uh, associated with extraction of energy resources. As you know, the kinds of conventional resources we've been relying on, the burning of fossil fuels produces CO2, which in turn is a big problem for us uh, in terms of global warming. And so we have a big effort involved in CO2 sequestration back into the earth. Although we overlap extensively with the School of Engineering in this regard, we also have efforts now in just the past few years in battery storage. Um, we're concerned about the economics of energy resources and then finally, we're deeply involved with the interrelationship between energy and the environment. 
and they're essentially inextricably linked. So I want to show you a little bit about what, what uh, all these programs entail. Um, so we'll start at the far upstream end, and that's the, the departments of geological sciences and geophysics, which are largely involved in the identification of natural resources uh, that have energy significance to us. Um, these are sort of the big five areas that we're involved in. One is the idea of exploration. Where do these energy resources occur? How did they get there? Why did they, why did they form? How do we characterize them? How do we model them as well? Uh, geophysics is one of the tools that we use to identify natural resources. For instance, all the oil and gas that we look for in offshore domains lies beneath the ocean and beneath the subsurface. How do you know it's there? That's basically the realm of geophysics. Um, a lot of what we do involves the chemistry of earth materials and their interaction with energy resources like oil and gas. So there's a great deal of work in uh, geochemistry. We're concerned about the very material pro uh, um, characteristics of, uh, for instance, gas reservoirs, that is their physical properties. And then finally, um, all that we do here in these first four categories generates a lot of data, big data. And so there's a great deal of what we do that's involved in computational modeling and on the management of big data, uh, big data sets. So just to briefly go th through some of these things, and obviously there's more detail here than many of you are familiar with, on the upstream end, uh, with regard to things like the reservoirs that, that contain natural gas and oil, we're concerned about those that are uh, occurring within calcium carbonate reservoirs, that is limestone. Uh, and it turns out limestone is a very reactive substance, it's highly su uh, subject to modification by acids. And so we're concerned about the geochemistry of uh, these kinds of, of reservoirs. As I just indicated, lots of the natural gas and oil that we find and produce today lies in deep water offshore, and it's essentially a detective game of trying to understand what the nature of those reservoirs are, where in fact they are. And so there's a large effort in our, um, in our school involved in the identification and characterization of deep water reservoirs. And as you know, for instance, from the, the Malconda uh, uh, incident, uh, this is a, a big risk item. These are things that we need to understand well. Uh, again, much of what we do beyond the basic characterization of geologic materials associated with energy is to model them. And so we have a computational model, modeling group that uh, is geared towards understanding uh, and predicting where oil and gas might be given certain geologic parameters so that we can forecast risks, so we can forecast economics. As I mentioned, we do a lot with the chemistry of energy substances, and so that involves understanding the chemistry of, for instance, gas reservoirs themselves, and also the liquids that are contained within them and how those change over time, both with geologic evolution, but also with um, the production of fluids and anything that we might introduce into the reservoir that might modify it. For instance, as you are all aware, because it's in the news frequently and it's controversial, we inject a lot of artificial fluids into reservoirs associated with fracking. And those fluids inevitably have some impact on the character, the chemistry of the reservoir. And these are things we need to understand uh, and plan for. Similarly, rocks have strength, but they don't have infinite strength. In fact, that's exactly what fracking is about. You can exceed the elastic strength of a rock and create a natural fracture, therefore promoting better fluid flow of gas and oil into a well bore. We need to understand those processes, know their limits, their risks, and so forth. And so geomechanics, or rock mechanics as, it, as it's called, is another important facet of what we do in SE3. And again, all these things have import for the environment. For instance, you're all aware, I think, because of news uh, articles about it, that uh, fracking in certain instances 
can induce seismicity, can create earthquakes. There have been earthquakes of increasing magnitude happening in places like Kansas and Oklahoma where they had not happened before. And many of these have to do with practices associated with fracking. Not necessarily the fracking itself, but potentially the injection of wastewater after fracking. And these are all things that we're concerned about. They basically um, are lumped together under the category of environmental geophysics. Related to that, for instance, also then is the mechanics of fracture itself, the in situ stresses involved, and again, how we engineer for those and do these wisely. Geochemistry appears in multiple ways for us. Uh, they, uh, for instance, uh, occur in instances where we inject CO2, as with se se sequestration of CO2, into reservoirs that formerly contained oil and gas, or maybe in the process of moving an oil and gas by using CO2 as a fluid to move the gas. What effect does that have on the reservoirs themselves? CO2 in high pressure, high temperature environments can be quite reactive with rock materials, and these are things that we have to understand to mitigate things like CO2 leakage. And also it turns out that um, there are a variety of ways in which CO2 can be injected back into the earth in innovative ways nobody had thought about before that can actually recombine with minerals and provide yet another place where we can sequester CO2 in the long run if the economics and the engineering feasibility exist. As I mentioned before, we use a lot of water in fracking. A lot of that water is problematic, and so we need to understand how fracking water uh, reacts in the subsurface, where it goes, how it affects water quality, particularly staying, keeping it away from uh, freshwater drinking sources. That's all geochemistry as well. And as I mentioned before, we're deeply concerned about um, the very physical properties of rocks, their strength, how it can be compromised, uh, or how it might be compromised. Uh, and also, as it turns out, ways in, in novel ways in which um, hydrocarbons that we might be interested in could be sequestered in some such uh, substances. So for instance, I mentioned gas hydrates earlier, and this may be something you're not aware of, but under high confining pressures and cold temperatures, as in the deep sea, it's actually possible to freeze water in the shallow subsurface in, the, in let's say 2,000 meters of water depth and lock up methane in the crystal structure of ice. This is what's called methane hydrate or gas hydrate. Turns out this is, occurs in the deep ocean all over the world and represents a vast, vast reservoir of, of methane, um, which as you all appreciate is essentially viewed as a transitional fuel for us to get to sort of a carbon-free energy system. So it's very important to us and at present, no one really knows exactly how to economically extract this, uh, uh, this particular material, how to do it safely, environmentally responsibly, and so that starts with understanding the very physical properties of gas hydrates, and so that's another thing that we do in our school. Um, and again, all of this involves a lot of things like high-resolution imaging, state-of-the-art imaging down at nanoscale, and so we're doing a lot of that with regard to rock materials. And that's done in part in the geophysics and geology departments and in part in energy resources engineering, Sally's home department. And then finally, as I've mentioned before, we're extensively involved in, in um, data analysis. And it's not generally appreciated, I think, by the public, but short of the defense world, um, it was Earth Sciences that first used supercomputers, first, in, first used the craze. And so we're, we've been deeply involved in data analysis for a very long time, and it plays out in all kinds of different ways. It has to do with things like seismic imaging. It has to do with modeling the history of oil maturation and trapping. It has to do with um, uh, understanding the complex structure at nanoscale of Earth materials. Long, long menu here, as you can see. So we're deeply involved in computational modeling as well. 
Now, as we move from the upstream energy sector, the things that we do in geology and geophysics, we move to the issues associated with extraction of natural resources, the wise and efficient engineering of those practices. And that's, again, where Sally's department is, is mainly involved. And so on one hand, it includes the obvious uh, element of simply the engineering, which has applicability to all of these energy resources. Um, but it also has to be done in a responsible way, a way that's going to produce the cleanest energy sources possible, both in terms of their actual utilization in the end, end game, but also in terms of the processes along the way, leakage issues that might occur, avoiding Malconda kinds of incidents, all of those. And those, too, have, have applications to essentially all of the energy sector, including these uh, strategic minerals that are associated with um, uh, high-tech devices, uh, but uh, wind, solar, as well as the conventional things you think of like oil and gas. And that's basically what this department does. There are many different aspects to this, you know, from ap optimization to the actual simulation, the modeling of, for instance, gas flow through a reservoir, the environmental assessment. Uncertainty is a really big deal because it plays out in risks, which ultimately affects economics monitoring practices for things, things like leaks of methane and so forth. And so that particular department, as you can see, is involved in a wide range of kinds of issues, including things like where we store energy, uh, how we now produce resources from shale, which has, as I'm sure you're aware, absolutely revolutionized the oil and gas situation for this country, putting us essentially now as a lead importer and producer or exporter and producer of, of um, oil and gas in the world um, and the optimization of that and again the sequestration of unwanted materials specifically co2 back into the earth in depleted reservoirs and so again we do this this computationally we do it observationally uh, we do it in the laboratory with a variety of kinds of experiments uh, and simulations that are basically done at the nanoscale to pore scale, uh, all the way up to the size of full oil and gas fields like this that are kilometers on a, on a side. All scales, again, very data intensive, data intensive, again, bringing us back to the idea of modeling and computational uh, data analysis. And then finally, it has been a big subject in our school for quite some time, with this issue of how do we deal with the CO2 that we're already producing in great excess. As you're all aware, we're headed towards levels of, of CO2 in the atmosphere that haven't been seen since 50 million years ago when there were crocodiles living in North Dakota, for instance, and we don't want to go there again. What can we do to mitigate? Uh, and we're considering all kinds of possibilities, right? Um, you know, for instance, in this case, alternative uh, uh, scenarios involving, uh, for instance, solar sources for, um, for um, thermal generation, as opposed to gas-fired ones, a variety of kinds of pathways and outcomes yielding, yielding ultimately to affecting uh, what kind of gas prices we have and the cost for clean um, electricity. And then finally, our fourth department is called Earth System Science. It's principally involved with issues of the environment, and inevitably that intersects right away with regard to what we do in the energy sector. And so much of what this particular department is doing is concerned about environmental remediation, also about climate change. Uh, we do a great deal with regard to predicting climate change, um, and also with regard to monitoring current energy systems with regard to issues like, like leakage. And so there's a, uh, one particular faculty member who's been heavily involved in, in cooperation with Precourt and with ERE towards understanding where methane leaks occur and how, once we know where they are, we can mitigate against those. Now, almost everything that I've described in our school is funded by either federal sources such as the Department of Energy or from industrial affiliates programs. And you all being new may not be so familiar with these, but these are essentially consortia of companies that are deeply involved with one or more as, uh, facets of engineering and science in energy, as I've just spoken of. And of course, these are all, in our particular case, mostly associated with the petroleum industry. 
And so they may be interested in funding research with regard to geophysical in imaging of the Earth, or maybe with some aspects of geochemistry, but they're very sector specific. Beyond that, though, there's a relatively new industrial affiliates program that one might consider a super program, and that it finally gets towards what we're trying to do in the university as a whole, and that is to span across all aspects of energy here at, at Stanford, from the science and engineering to the economics, um, in one under one umbrella. And this program, which has been in place for a few years now, involves faculty from essentially all the schools in the university, as well as the institutes. It's called the Natural Gas Initiative. As I mentioned earlier, natural gas is widely viewed as a very important transition fuel for us to get to a carbon-free future. And this particular program then embodies really what we want to do at Stanford uh, as a whole in terms of full integrated views of the energy system. I'll just show a couple of slides to give you a little window into this. Um, the goals of the Natural Gas Initiative are, as I've just indicated, to create original research and new knowledge about every aspect of natural gas. So that includes, again, the most upstream of where natural gas occurs to the most downstream of the energy economics of the resource. And this, of course, does give us an opportunity to interact with these private sector uh, groups and hopefully quickly get into practice with them some of the learnings that we've developed here at Stanford, as well as obviously to give a chance for our students to be, become interactive with them and potentially seek employ, employment in those sectors. Um, and we're trying to do this uh, in a way that produces the most reproducible, solid, factual data that we can. You know, we're in an era of alternative or uh, facts, and this particular uh, program seeks to get past the politics and get to the real basics of the energy system. So um, this is probably a bit small, but at least it gives you some idea of the range of kinds of general areas that are being covered in the Natural Gas initi Initiative uh, that include, uh, like I mentioned before, things like uh, emissions issues, conversions of methane to other kinds of useful products, unconventional resources that we haven't really thought of. I mentioned gas hydrates earlier, uh, technologies and engineerings. Um, and what you'll notice here in the membership roster that um, this particular industrial affiliates program is supported by all kinds of different private sector elements. It includes naturally oil and gas companies, but it also includes uh, generators, uh, electrical generators. Um, it includes some groups that are involved with the downstream economics. Um, and this group, this, this particular program is thriving and expanding and is really bringing together a lot of different sectors here in the university that had previously not necessarily been in, the, in, in full contact with one another. So again, this particular initiative is involved with both the science and the engineering, but also the commercial and economic aspects, and ultimately how those play out, play out in terms of policy regulation and uh, how that ultimately uh, uh, enters into the political arena. And so, again, unconventional resources, uh, these uh, are things that uh, are there and available for use with regard to natural gas, but have generally not been tapped into because of lack of understanding of the science and, and engineering practice or because of the economics. Obviously, again, this involves a lot of data generation, and so there's a, a very important computational side of this. There's the environmental side with regard to the issue of emissions and uh, monitoring them, detecting them, and mitigating them. And then downstream, ultimately, for those of you from the business school, how this plays out in terms of the economic arena. Now, all of these areas are areas that we in our school are working on as well, but this represents, as I mentioned, an opportunity to branch out beyond the, the blinders and confines of our particular school and interact with a more broad community that's uh, really deeply concerned with the holistic view of energy and methane conversion into other kinds of products that have potential use in society. So, 
that's what I want to leave you with. Um, I'd hope that during the course of your time here at Stanford, you take the opportunity to come over and sample some of what we have to offer. Again, those are, you, you all are obviously deeply interested in this or you wouldn't be here today. Um, we offer a certain perspective. It's an important perspective, but just a piece, but one nevertheless that I hope that you will take advantage of. And so thank you very much. I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Has anything been mentioned of that no. here? All right. So um, uh, a year and a half ago, we got a new president. Uh, and soon thereafter, we got a new provost. Uh, the, new pr the president came from outside of Stanford. The new provost was formerly the dean of School of Engineering, and then before that had been director of SLAC. Um, like usually happens when there's an administration change, the new president and provost want to chart the way forward for Stanford for the next couple of decades. Um, and so they impaneled a, um, uh, well, they, they created a, a process that I think is unusual, if not unique, among universities. They basically went to crowdsourcing. We're in Silicon Valley. Why not? Well, what does that mean in this context? They basically invited the faculty, staff, and students, and alums to submit ideas about Stanford for the next couple of decades any subject, everything's fair game. So um, as you might imagine, we got all kinds of results. Some are inspired and brilliant, and some are just plain stupid, <laughs> truth be told. And many conflict with one another. There were about 3,000 of these submitted to us. And so they impaneled a group of committees of uh, responsible university citizens to sort through all of these and bend them into categories. The categories were education, research, the Stanford community, and beyond Stanford. And they found that in all of these 3,000 ideas, a number of things kept popping in each one of these categories. So eventually it became a matrix of those four areas and then a bunch of crosscuts like that. And so a number of those crosscuts, in fact, uh, deeply involved the energy sector. There are issues about computation. There are uh, issues about big data. Uh, there are issues about the natural world, which includes things like the fundamental properties of materials, and I've already mentioned their importance here. Uh, they include sustainability and a variety of other things, as you might imagine, including health, human health issues and uh, curricular issues and so forth. Uh, and so we're at the point, so what happened was these committees worked for s six months, produced a bunch of white papers, and then the executive um, cabinet of the university, which is the president, provost, the vice provost, provost and the deans, uh, spent another four or five months basically trying to shape these into a vision. And that happened as of the end of June, uh, this past June, when the president made his first public disclosure about the results of the process. So now we're to the point where we're going to start implementing these processes. And so we're in the process now of creating a bunch of design teams that are actually going to put flesh on the bones that I just described and move us towards a bunch of these kinds of areas. Uh, my particular responsibility as, as uh, dean is to move along the issue of sustainability, which again is a very important thing in our school. but Clearly, it's very important for the university and for the world as a whole, right? We can't keep living the way we've been living without doing some things differently, and the energy arena is one of those. So now that you're here, you're going to be hearing in this coming year more and more news coming out about this initiative, which is called the Long Range Planning Process. Um, there may well be opportunities for you to be involved in this as well through focus groups and so forth. If those opportunities do present themselves, I'd encourage you to, to participate and speak up. Uh, we have so many creative minds here at Stanford. You obviously the newest of those creative minds and all ideas and certainly all the energies of, of, uh, of thought are most welcome in this. And so 
that's pretty much what the long range planning uh, process is about right now. We expect to see some great things happen. I'll just give you two previews very quickly. The president was in, in June and his announcement was mostly operating at a very high level, but he did say a couple of things that were very specific about sustainability. And, and one is that we intend by 2025 to get to 80% uh, reduction over our 2011 11 level of carbon footprint. And Stanford's already ahead of every other university in the country with regard to that right now. And you will see the SESI plant. They haven't yet, have they? No, they, we go there for dinner tonight. That's part of this, this process. We're going to go even further. And we won't be doing that with carbon offsets. We'll be doing it the real way. Um, similarly, uh, he announced that yeah, I'm not casting aspersions in any East Coast universities there, just so you know. <laughs> um, and uh, we intend to get to 100% uh, or to zero waste by 2025 as well. So really ambitious goals, but very important goals. And to the extent that Stanford in doing this can become a demonstration for other places to do that, that's certainly the hope for outcome. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much.